Good afternoon and welcome to The Take Up. Today we have episode 90, Holidays and Handwork, Digitizing Preparation and Design. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take Up. Happy to have you in for yet another Education Friday, an important Friday today as we have a lot of wonderful announcements and recognition of all the people who are in the community today. So it's been great. If you haven't caught me on any of the other lives earlier today, it was the day where the Reggies get announced and a lot of... Uh, uh, those awards through the Two Regular Guys podcast, which is for the decoration industry. Uh, they actually recognize a lot of people who are here in our community, in the reciprocator community, uh, people who create uh, embroidery and other decoration content. And so it's been a really awesome day for that stuff. And what I'd like to say is you reciprocators have been great. I didn't really promote it because I wasn't planning to be kind of a, a force in the Reggie since I'm involved with the Two Regular Guys podcast. But you folks brought the take up into the mix. So I uh, thank you very much for the recognition. And uh, before we talk about anything else, I just want to say, you know, thanks guys. Thank you for uh, caring about the show, for liking the show, for showing up and for listening. Been happy to have you all here and happy to see you here uh, every day and commenting. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about some things that are kind of unique to holiday embroidery for me and for uh, a lot of the other work that I've done. You guys know that most of my work has been in a very commercial field. Uh, often have to do with business to business work, uh, work that deals with logos, works that are usually fairly geometric, has a lot of type involved, which may be may or may not be why I know so many font names and why you may catch me uh, discussing these sorts of things more often where I talk about font names, stitch types that relate to that small text, uh, nomenclature of fonts and logos, design files, things like that, maybe a little bit about um, style guides and control, stuff like that. It's because most of my work has been commercial. However, what I find is that in my career, as I lead into the holidays and honestly around most holidays, I get many, many more requests for things that are decorative, for things that are uh, kind of in that vein of something hand worked. Now, I will say there is kind of a big spectrum over what you might consider something that's hand worked. And we're going to talk about what people really think about when they define something as hand work or hand embroidery work versus what they think about as commercial work. Um, certainly when I say commercial embroidery or when I'm talking about commercial embroidery in this case, especially today, I'm really talking about commercial logo types. I'm talking about um, geometric work. I'm talking about the kind of stuff that we would generally see on the left chest of a sport shirt going into uh, uniforming or into the corporate world. That is what I'm talking about when I say commercial embroidery in this case. There's tons of commercial embroidery that is fashion in the real commercial embroidery world. There's lots of people doing fashion work. There's lots of people doing things for home decor. And I'll, like pretty much everything I'm showing you today, aside from some examples of actual handwork that I think are interesting to look at, um, is really commercial work. But it's done to emulate something that's more like handwork. The thing that's funny about this is um, when we talk about things that are hand worked, I think that there's some really weird assumptions that are made about what handwork looks like. And when we make things in machine embroidery, I think what we're really trying to do is differentiate it from kind of the clean mechanical look of something that would usually be done for a logo type that would usually be done for, or if you think about other commercial or retail ways to use embroidery, certainly like a mascot, a standard cap, something like that. Those things are generally uh, more commercial. They're tight, they're clean, the coverage is complete. They tend to be shiny as far as the sheen of the thread itself. They tend to have full coverage densities on everything. They have a tendency to be, like I said, clean edged, geometric, and very regular. Whereas then the other side of that, when somebody tries to emulate handwork with embroidery or with machine embroidery, they have a tendency to want to go against those features and functions and maybe look a little looser, a little warmer is a nice way to put it, certainly. But they're trying to introduce flaws. The funny thing is, if you've ever seen masterful hand embroidery, they have the control over every single stitch. And someone who is masterful at hand embroidery uh, makes a clean stitch that's as clean as anything we produce. And in fact, a lot of their silk shading and uh, a lot of the stitch types that they use are, are things we not only cannot do, but we don't get the control over every single uh, stitch. And we can't travel underneath the workpiece because as you know, with an embroidery machine, all we have with interlock embroidery machines is the ability to have straight lines from one point to another point. We can trim and jump, but other than that, we can't travel under. So if we connect from one place to another, we've got a piece of thread between those two points. There's just nothing we can do about that aside from cut, which is incredibly time consuming and not going to be done in any kind of commercial sphere and really isn't something you should do every time you want to you know, drop another shading line in some silk shading. So that's one of those things. 
Um, let's go ahead and say hi to a couple of people who have commented. If you are here, if you're around, I'd love to have you comment. Hey, share this with somebody else who you think might enjoy this. Join in. Uh, talk about your projects too. I always like to bring that stuff in. But like I said, we're going to go back in and we're going to define some things about emulating hand embroidery, talk a little about software, talk a little bit about functions and features, and I'll show you some samples and discuss what I think we do with, with this case and exactly how we get there. You know, we'll talk a little bit about that. I think it's interesting to use it in places you might not expect. Uh, and I wish I hadn't had, didn't have time to bring up as many examples as I wanted to. I will recommend, um, there are some cool examples that I've actually shown you earlier in talking about kind of non-standard embroidery where people apply some of these techniques, these different styles and looks to corporate art. And I think it's really cool. If you look at the episode I did where I showed some samples from Jeremy Picker uh, from, from his, uh, his kind of creative outlook is to do uh, distressed appliques and cool treatments and different stitch treatments on corporate work. You can do that. But a lot of the stuff about handwork really has to do with breaking away from that traditional look. But let's say hi to a few people while we have a chance. I know everybody says get to the content. We're going to get to the content. Trust me, it's going to keep going. But let's say hi to a few people. We have Gusta coming in from Sweden. Yosta, happy to have you in here. Uh, hi. Uh, we have Frank Dunn. By the way, Frank from the UK, congratulations. I know you didn't get up all the way to the voting, but you got in there for a community member who was useful and helpful and awesome in the uh, two other guys reggie award so congratulations i believe you deserve it my friend uh ramona also in the voting one of the reggie award one of the reggie award nominees who's going to be in the voting uh, ramona hey hey or ho 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 merry christmas yeah christmas is coming and i find that i am re requested to or required to do more hand style work or more decorative folk style work around christmas but what i'm going to tell you is if I look overall in my entire career, I've done more folk style work for things like um, peasant blouses, for things that were in fashion or home decor. Honestly, I've done more hand style work for that than I have for the holidays. But the holidays seem to be a time where it clumps together, where I'm not just doing projects. I'm doing uh, more work where somebody wants a warmer feeling to it because the whole concept of uh, kind of this comfortable sitting around the fire Christmas time and including, I would even include this, the harvest period of time too, the fall where it's sweater weather, that kind of concept plays out into this warmth, into these thick threads, into the kind of things I'm going to talk about with handwork anyway. But I, I'll say truthfully, I've done more bohemian work. I've done more folk style work, I would say overall than I've done, um, you know, the holiday style work, but we'll talk about this one. Like I said, I, this may not be the only time we talk about this topic and I may do something more technical on it that doesn't do more definition, but the truth of the matter is there are different functions. There are different things we can do in software. And honestly, I feel like knowing how we categorize it and what we're after lets us look for the tool we want to use to do this work. And frankly, I'm going to say, this is one of the places where I've done the most um, manual work. And I mean, literally punching things stitch by stitch to get what I want, because even though there are functions to do things like randomizing at some times, I think um, there's just nothing that completely takes away for me the desire to do some manual work to drop individual stitches or or to go into my stitch file to break out of the the expanded or into the expanded file out of the condensed file, the vector style, the working file and move around to individual stitches because I think sometimes I can just get things that I can't get without doing some individual stitch work. But yeah, Merry Christmas, Happy <laughs> a little bit early, right? But at least this time, unlike last year, I did my holiday kind of episode uh, in December when it was a little too late. And I am gonna re reference that in the links list because I know uh, some people asked me for the sweater pattern, the vector sweater pattern that I gave out last year. I will go ahead and reference that episode so you can go back and look for that when you talk about that as well. Lori says, hello. Hi, Lori. I don't even know if I should dignify this as an answer. Justin Armenta, digitizer and nominee himself says, hello, DJ E. Rich. That's from uh, my one of my co-hosts or one of the hosts of the two regular guys, Terry Combs, who likes to call me that. I don't know why. I will say that is one of the only times I said I didn't want to have that nickname. I walked into a shop one time and uh, the first thing I heard was Big E. But I said, no, nah, that's all right. E would be fine if you have to. But Eric's great. <laughs> anyway, uh, Jeff, Jeff Fuller in from Fuller Embroidery Works and the Embroidery Nerd. And Jeff and Adam, by the way, uh, congratulations to both of you for being nominated for Reggie Awards. So awesome to have you guys in the community and rising star. Adam, always great from BJJHats.com. Maureen is in. Hi from Pennsylvania. Hi. Hi, Heather. And uh, Frank says thanks, but you you definitely earned it, Frank. You are a community booster and you're always helping out, my friend. And Gina says, I've been looking forward to this topic. You know, like I said, if you want to talk about things in this, ask questions and hit me in the comments. I would love to bring up more of that. 
derail me if you want. I, I have no problem with that. I will chase that scroll down <laughs> for sure. Sandy says, hi. Hi, Sandy. Happy to have you. And Anthony Shen says, good morning and happy to have you in as well, Anthony. So thank you guys for showing up. Thank you for being here. And let's have a little discussion. Uh, number one, I'm just going to go ahead and give you the links list in case you want it. There are only a couple things on there for today because we only have a couple things we're featuring um, currently right now. Unfortunately, it's not previewing the link correctly, but we have a, an article from Images Magazine where and I talk about uh, emulating handwork and we're going to go through some of this stuff. It's called Automatic Artisan. That's what they called it. They sometimes change my titles, but I like that they used alliteration in this one. You guys know that I like to do that. So that was cool, but that's at linkslist.app and you'll see that right there. And I can drop that in the comments as well. As I have found out, much to my great chagrin, if I drop the comment before I go live, um, not all platforms are saving that comment. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop that in. That is in the comments now. If you'd rather have it clickable, jump on that later and you can grab that article and take a look. Uh, the other thing you're going to find on the links list this time around is episode 45 from last year from the holidays where I did the holiday survival guide. I talked about how to set expectations with your customers. I think that is still super important. And frankly, it might be more important than any of the fun stuff I'm doing here. Uh, it talks about that as well as quick things that you can embroider as gifts. We talk about ornaments and stuff like that. And I actually discussed the phone knits that I'm going to talk a little bit about today as well, because I've had another person or a couple of people, honestly, uh, within the last week and within the last month, more and more asking me about phone knits, both um, what I used to do for the prints, which is in this in that episode as well for fake ugly sweater prints. It's something that's out now again. I, I keep expecting this trend to die and it has not died yet. So people are doing uh, the printed fake ugly sweaters and the method that I use to make faux knit work out of thick thread. And that's something that's in that episode in a little more detail. And we'll probably touch on it a little bit today as well. But go check that out. It's at the links list. You can get a chance to take a look at that article that's there as well. So like I said, I, I think we'll cover a little bit more about this. I'm going to discuss kind of what people are looking for for thread and for the way we handle our stitches in the in the way of emulating handwork. And I'm going to talk a little more obliquely, a little more uh, broad strokes about how I tend to go about looking to emulate a piece of actually handmade work. Uh, honestly, when we're looking at any kind of fiber art, I think there are a few things we look at that we can say universally are going to be important to us to emulate to get the look in order to capture what it is that makes a, per, a particular kind of hand embroidery look the way it looks. There are things we can look at. But the first thing I'm going to talk about uh, isn't really necessarily about emulating real handwork. It's about the kind of things people do when they try to emulate handwork with machine embroidery. And I'd like to just kind of cover some of those things and then walk through some photographs, look at them uh, of both my pieces and pieces that I've looked at both in kind of retail research and in general and discuss what makes them look the way they look and maybe what we can do as far as emulating that and what people are doing to capture it. So first of all, let's go ahead and just kind of talk about this stuff, right? So what do I mean when I say hand embroidery? Obviously I'm talking about uh, needle and thread in the hand. That is fine. The thing is, like I said earlier, kind of in the intro, I think that when people are trying to define hand embroidery or emulate it with machine embroidery, they have some things definitely in mind for what I would call, funny enough, kind of the hand embroidered look that's achieved with machine embroidery and commercial embroidery. And this is not just uh, in a craft space, this is not just in a commercial space. Uh, when we're talking about custom work, this is definitely in the retail space. This is definitely in the fashion space. Um, I, I see certain things that are repeated over and over as almost memes or effects that continually get kind of hammered on. And the thing is, we all know what we can control about uh, stitches in any in any shape, way, shape, and form, right? No matter how we're dealing with stitches, you know, I always talk about the only stitch. We can only make a line from one point to another, and the thickness of that line is set by the thread that we choose to use. That is the only thing we can really do. However, how we put those together makes a difference. So what can we change about a stitch? About any stitch, any stitch type, or any stitch we put together, we can change the length of that stitch. We have that. We can change uh, how they are put together. So how far apart they are, that is density. And you're actually going to see in some softwares and in some uh, programs that do what I call a handwork effect and what they may call a hand stitch effect depends on the software. They will do sometimes call that a mass, but that mass really is just about densities. It's about densities and layering. That's about all it is. So we can change stitch length. We can change uh, we can change density, so how close together things are. We can change layering. We can change angles. That's all we can really do. That is, that's the stuff that we have available to us. Aside from changing colors, aside from layering things together, that's what we've got. 
So there we are. Oh, as I can see, guys, it looks like I've got a misspelling on that. I will go ahead and change that now. It's probably why somebody put a laugh up for me. You could drop that in the comments if you want to fix it. But yeah, there we are. Um, hand embroidery. What are we talking about in that case? We're talking about the differences between what people think hand embroidery should look like versus machine embroidery. And part of the thing is machine embroidery is very regular. It's very mechanical. It tends to have a standard pattern. It tends to be very shiny. It has, has clean edges. That's mostly what we do with machine embroidery. However, when we're talking about hand embroidery, most people are trying to emulate something that is uh, not like that. So we're not just taking a hand piece of work. We're not just trying to do silk shading. We're not just trying to do French knots. We're not just trying to do hand stitching or a type of hand stitching, maybe, you know, Trapunto, Sashiko, whatever it is. What we're also often seeing is people trying to emulate what is what I would almost call a more um, rustic look. We'll go ahead and say rustic. That's probably the nicest way to say it. But what it usually has are a few things in common. It usually has thickness. The individual passes, the individual stitches uh, very likely are thick. They are either thick through a couple different means, right? We can use different means to get there, but they are thicker than the standard uh, standard stitches, what we're going to see in most uh, machine embroidery, especially if you're seeing like two passes of straight stitches, usually very thin, very fine. We may use multi-pass stitching. We may use thread, whatever that is. We're usually looking to get thickness or we're looking for a look that is like floss. So most of the time where I see people who are, like I said, emulating hand embroidery, what it is is very amateur hand embroidery. It looks like hand embroidery that was done by someone who doesn't do this all the time. It is country cute. It is rustic. And that's usually the look. Or it's just done by someone who is not a master. That's part of the look because of the cleanliness, the sharpness, the shininess of usual machine embroidery. The opposite is to go for this floss look. And like I said, that can be achieved through thick threads that can be achieved through multi-pass stitching, which we'll talk about as well. And, and those things are both often seen, like I said, within the commercial sphere, within the fashion sphere, it's all over the place. That's part of what we do. So the thickness and the floss look is something that we're going to be looking for when we're emulating hand embroidery. So whichever way we want to attack that, whether we're looking to use thicker threads, you're going to go get a wool blend fuzzy thread. That's part of it. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, that is part of what we're doing. We're seeing thickness being represented as part of the, what we're looking for. Once again, something that is a little clumsier that looks more like a full strand of floss. If you guys know anything about hand embroidery, or what is often done, especially like counted stuff, cross stitch, stuff like that, you may use uh, multiple strands or individual strands of floss to develop a thicker thread for what you're stitching, what have you. So it, it is that floss look that we're looking at. And sometimes it is that cotton look we're looking at, and that's part of it. Uh, one of the other things you're going to see is uh, randomness. People are sometimes expecting, like I said, because of the regularity of machine embroidery, when they're trying to emulate hand stitching, they're looking for a certain amount of randomness, whether that's randomness in stitch length, randomness in density, if you have that as a setting, or whether that's randomness in stitch angle, they're expecting that things aren't placed mechanically exactly on the line. And because machine embroidery defaults to that through software, especially, um, the concept of things being random or rough edge is another thing. Edge quality is part of that randomness as well. But that is one of the things we can see. So whether it's stitch length, whether it's angle, whatever it is, the concept really is to me that if something is done by an amateur at home, that's the concept that we're kind of thinking about. That's the attitude. Well, then that would be more random, more rough because the person is not going to be as mechanical or as skilled. And certainly it's not going to look like machine embroidery where it's placed precisely by you know, a computerized machine. Uh, the other things we're certainly looking for, uh, by all means, would be uh, sheen. The sheen of the embroidery, frequently we're using polyesters and rayons that have an extremely high sheen. They're very shiny. They have a highlight and a shadow that's very distinct. And in general, um, that sheen is common to almost all machine embroidery. We know that mostly we're using polyesters and rayons so that we have a similar sheen throughout. Now, in recent years, we now have the ability to get more uh, th more thread types that are common that wash the way we want to, that wear the way we want to, that have the UV fastness, uh, color fastness that we want. And we have matte finished polyesters, which are still very clean edged. They are certainly not fuzzy, but they do have a matte finish. And that may be one way that people go. The other thing that people sometimes will do is use different fibers or thread types. Either they will use cotton threads or they will use a polyester thread that's spun, that has some fibrousness to it, or we'll use a blended thread or a thick thread, like I've talked about before, like Bermelana is one of them. There's a lot of others, flame. There's other uh, threads that either have different uh, fiber content or are just fuzzy or thick. And that's another way that we might handle that. And that's to get roughness. If we're thinking about the sheen of standard modern machine embroidery, it's going to be very shiny, very smooth, 
when we're thinking about something that's hand embroidered with floss, then we're expecting that there's going to be a certain kind of roughness. And certainly if we're thinking about a natural bohemian kind of look, which may be part of this as well, then roughness and the roughness in the fiber type can be part of that as well. So as part of the randomness, what are we looking at overall? We are looking for a kind of thickness, a look of floss. We're looking for uh, either thick thread multipass stitching can be used. We're looking for some randomness and then some roughness as part of that. And that also includes some other, some other characteristics, including edge quality. So just like the randomness of say stitch length, just like the randomness in the density or the angle or uh, the variability in that, Edge quality is a big one. It's one of the easiest ones we can do in any software is that we can set our edge quality for feathering or we can set it for roughness or jaggedness. And that's just the concept that if someone was doing this by hand who's an amateur, they're not going to place that needle perfectly along every edge on every line. Now, I will say one of the other things we sometimes have in this space is a concept of making something look vintage. And in that case, that roughness is also kind of mixed up with the idea of something being distressed and it, it being distressed in that something that's vintage has been around for a while has gone through some wear and tear and so it's going to show that wear and tear and we may also be mocking that now i don't think the holidays are as likely to have that going on we have a lot of stuff that is intended to be shiny showy and beautiful it may not be intended to have that kind of roughness or distress but if somebody is doing once again that kind of country cute attitude toward it or if they're doing the bohemian, you know, denim jacket style that I've often done, then those things may be part of it. The roughness may also be part of having things uh, that are distressed, that are supposed to look rough because they're not uh, in their original quality. now, And that takes a lot more work than just having some edge roughness. Certainly edge roughness can help. It can make it look a little bit more like that. But this is more like the stuff that I was discussing that Jeremy Picker does, where he has things like partially destroyed applique, specifically missing stitches that look like missing stitches. They don't just look like some variation in how close or far apart the stitches are. It's not just density variation. It is missing portions or missing areas, and it can be roughness or distress to the ground material. That can be part of this whole kind of cloud of things that are considered hand embroidery. In general, I don't think that's what we're talking about today. When I think talk about roughness here, I think it's more about this coarseness. And the concept is that the embroidery of the people folk embroidery may well have been done more likely with coarse materials on coarse fabrics uh, also perhaps with coarser threads they aren't fine they are not as refined perhaps as machine embroidery so those are the kind of things we're looking for uh certainly there are some some things to do with stitch type as well and like i said we're gonna review this again but i just thought this is a good list to get through um Stitch type is certainly part of it because you do not see nearly as often in hand embroidery um, the concept of that we would consider a fill stitch. So I'm going to say satins versus fills here, but satins in this case, what I mean is just that we're not doing a seating stitch, a fill stitch, a tatami stitch nearly as often with this kind of work. If it's supposed to look like hand worth, then that paved stitch is not as common. And we usually instead will have something like a broken or partially split satin overlap satin stitches. And certainly there's all manner of filling stitches that can be used that are not the ones we're usually used to. But in that kind of um, triad of stitches that we commonly use in machine embroidery, what it means is in the way of filling stitches, we're more likely to fill an area with multiple satins or split satins or length limited satins, something that has some breaking in it. So we don't have long, uh, usually so we don't have super long loops or just lap satins in general rather than using what we would commonly consider fills. And even if we do use fill stitches in, in this kind of work, we're going to have a desire to do some sort of randomness to the stitch length, some sort of jaggedness on our edges, if we're looking for what I call, like I said, that emulated hand embroidery look. So that's certainly part of it. Uh, the other things we're certainly looking at would be motif stitching. Uh, it's more common to have stitch types that are actual stitch types. Now, certainly in hand embroidery, you can do things like actually make knots, actually weave stitches on top of the fabric, things that we cannot do with a machine. However, the concept of things like feather stitches, back stitches that to us th are more like motif stitches. We may have programmatic versions of those in our software, depending on our software. Um, but those, those are more likely 
repeated patterns of what we consider manual or straight stitches. And that motif stitching is certainly another part of it. And those, like I said, often will emulate things that you might see in a sampler, which is a collection and something that's stitched out to show or for someone to practice hand embroidery stitches. And some of those stitches like feather work, turkey works, things like that, that may also be a portion of it that you'll see as well as counted stitching. So counted stitching, like cross stitching, Bargello is kind of like that too. There's other stitching that is counted, but the one that we're most familiar with, especially in the US, I would say is probably cross stitch. So cross stitches uh, also can be part of that. And there may be tools in your software to make that easier. But with that, I'd like to look at maybe some samples of these things too, and just talk about, you know, just some, some graphical samples of handwork emulation and discuss what I'm talking about to a degree and show you what some of those commercial samples that we're talking about. And certainly, like I said, this is also in that article that I showed you guys um, that is in the links list and we can discuss that as well. Um, but I will show you some samples. We can talk about that. Certainly this is the initial sample. And I have another photo of this piece. The reason why I sent this into images to show them is that this is something that's held up uh, as that handwork style. And this is a very easy one to see because we're looking at this in a single color. And this is right off of a fashion rack. And it was with a load of these kind of um, bohemian necklines. Like I said, I know I'm, I'm equating this with, with uh, the holiday work. And I think there is something to that because I, like I said, I've done a lot of hand emulation work for the holidays, certainly. Once again, we're doing stuff that's like, when you're going home for the holidays, things like cross stitch, things like little sayings, things like little images that can go on decorations are more likely to be used. More of my experience is here. But the thing I wanted to kind of point out with this is that despite this thing from a distance looking very much like handwork, or at least having that feeling of handwork, it's really easy to see that we have not used anything but a single thickness of thread and that the only stitches that are here are essentially straight stitches. Um, and that's something that I think kind of goes by the wayside. Sometimes people might not notice that. If they were looking at it, they might think of these as different stitches, but I'll try and bring the original image up so we can kind of get closer to it. And if we're looking at it, uh, number one, you can see that these things are all connected. These are runs of essentially a motif. We have this little kind of almost satin-like motif here. They are done in a thicker thread, yes, than the standard 48 thread. However, this is not super thick thread. And the thickness that we're having and the illusion of big, thick stitches that we're seeing here in this thread is done through multi-pass stitching. You can see how we have this big penetration point that I'm kind of circul circling here with my cur cursor. Um, that penetration point is stretched and kind of large because we have multiple stitches that are all landing in that same spot before we transition to the na next stitch. So this is a multi-pass stitch. It may be called a bean stitch. It may be controlled by something called count in your software. This is the number of times we go over a single stitch before we move on to the next stitch. So the thick, the thread thickness hasn't changed at all from something else that they were going to do commercially in this, in this case. And as you can see, we're not trimming and jumping. We're not working under the material. This is all done connected in one big filament of thread. So there's multi-pass stitching there. We can also see if we zoom in kind of close into this floral, that what we're getting here, uh, we have a couple of passes on each of these satin runs. We're certainly getting these tight passes. We're having some variation in our density and that could be done either through doing this manually or it can be done through settings if your software has settings for that variation you can also just delete stitches you can see here these stitches have been deleted because we have a, what looks like to me is that we have a pass here and back that's been deleted and there's still a connector that's showing over on this left hand side so what this would indicate to me is somebody wanted some of that roughness there and so they went into their software and they would literally jump in and just delete this stitch out of the satin piece. This could essentially be a satin run with some roughness to it. In this case, I think that the loose weave of the garment, I think Gina is correct on this one too. The loose weave of that material is enhancing the hand look. And if we're allowing the needle to track into that, that very coarse open woven, it can actually pull those stitches together and cause some of that look to happen as well. So it can be part of the interaction. But the thing to think about here is that this very hand embroidered look really is just about loose coverage, multi-pass stitches, thickness, and the fact that we're using what's very likely a spun, spun polyester or a cotton thread that has a little bit of buzz to it. And I think that that's something interesting to think about. That really isn't changing anything about our actual material that we're using. It's a, or at least not in such a way that it is alien to what we do in a commercial sense, even in the way we handle our stitches or we handle our digitizing. 
so much as it is using that to emulate those looks that we were talking about. So we have the thick thread look, we have the uh, multi-pass that's doing that job, as well as we have the sheen. And the thing that we really have changed materially in this case is using the spun polyester. And I think you see it in a lot of, in a lot of commercial embroidery. And like I said, I've got some stuff here that's mine as well as some stuff that's commercial. And I'll show you some of this stuff too. You may have seen me talk about it before. Um, there's this whole kind of period where jean jackets came in for a little while and I took a lot of pictures from that. And you're going to see that we have these emulated stitch types, but a lot of it that's interesting is that it looks like we're using really thick threads here. And I'll tell you when you get super close to this one, that is not thick thread. That is uh, five passes probably. It's either four or five passes on each one of these straight stitches. And as you can see, there are connectors in between them. So this is very much done commercially in the way you might expect. So that's on denim. That's just using, once again, a spun polyester thread. And you can see that we're using straight stitches and we're not caring very much about our stitch patterns. It doesn't look so much like a fill stitch because we've done it by drawing straight stitch patterns back and forth. Though I would say they're actually fairly regular in their um, stitch lengths here. And that's kind of a, a dead giveaway that it's being done just with a standard straight stitch and with multiple passes. Uh, the thing is the effect when you zoom out from this piece does make it look very much like a coarse floss based work. So what have we really done here? Um, this is very much like any other kind of black work. All we've done is we're very careful about how far apart our lines are so that we have some daylight. And I'd say, honestly, on this one, they didn't care. They are achieving full coverage in some of these areas, but we have variation between how far apart the lines are. That's the randomness. We have some roughness. And as we're working through this piece, we've got all of these multi-pass stitches. The thing is with the handwork, if the way we're trying to make this thing look is that it was done by an amateur, the great thing is we can do this stuff. And I would say this is a great time to take out your uh, pen tablet if you're someone who likes to use that and drop those stitches in and out of that line, go in and drop those engraving style stitches. And don't worry too much about your stitch penetration points because you don't have to worry so much about how close those lines are either, as long as we know about how much density we're achieving. The thing is, it really can be very loose because the look is loose. The look is rough. And like I said, I think I think of this as a holiday thing as well because there are things like uh, emulated knits and because so many things in the holidays are supposed to have an heirloom quality to them, whereas not a lot of the people I know right now are doing heirloom work. They're not doing hand work. You might bemoan that and say it's sad that we're not seeing people hand stitch all of their stockings for their grandkids. But I think that the interesting thing is we're often looking at that as an ideal, the kind of old home or country ideal. And we're trying to get that without having to do that hand work sometimes. But we do at least have the ability to, at the very least, give the feeling of it with our, our machine embroidery. And we can bring something interesting. If all people have seen is the standard type out your key borrowed font and go version of things, um, it is very interesting to show them something that is like this or to work with something that has some different texture. And like I said, I just thought I'd show you some samples of what we're looking at. Once again, from, from a distance, it looks like we have some sort of French knots going on here. It looks like we might have some sort of feather work that's going on here. And it looks very much like floss. But when we zoom in on this piece, very obviously what we have is essentially candle wicking here. And yes, this is a commercial piece right out of a store and there are trims all through it. They did not bother to trim those out. It's just connected. You might say that's lazy. I'd say that that is uh, efficient, but there's the thickness of the thread we're using. Very obviously it is not as thick as it looks here. And they are hiding, if you want to call it hiding, those thread runs along their edges. They still have the connectors. So when we look at that though, I would say if we look at the handshake distance, you can call it the social distance if you want and step back even another three feet. Uh, pieces like this look handmade because of that roughness, because of the sense of thickness, because of how that's done. And how would we achieve this? Uh, quite simply, as we're going to draw our lines, we would either draw them as usual and use a count or use a bean stitch so that we have those multi-passes, or if you want it to have some more randomness and not drop individually into these uh, holes or, or repeatedly into the same holes, you could just do multiple passes, but then you're more likely, uh, unless you're very careful about dropping a point there every time uh, as you're drawing your straight stitch, you may end up where it looks more varied and it looks more like traditional uh, machine embroidery because you won't have that deep penetration point there. I'd say, honestly, you can see that what they're doing is doing a run of straight stitch. It's really easy to analyze. So this is nothing I wanna show you guys. Design analysis can be done on finished pieces, especially something simple as this. We can run out the stitches and run them back, or we can run out a, a single run of stitches up to the end of this line, run our bean stitch back across it, 
we jump one manual stitch over and then we're back up and back out. Now this can be done manually or it can be done with a straight stitch or bean stitch just as easily. I think that honestly, it's a simple thing for us to do. And if your software does a beginning and end points on uh, straight stitching, you may even just be able to drop that back stitch there and let it travel for itself. Honestly, with something like this, if it was something I was going to reuse that was going to be an heirloom piece, I'd probably do some of that work manually or do the cheat, which is to drop a hard node at each of these stitch penetration points and do it and run back and forth. So it's semi-manually, but I'm using a straight stitch tool to make sure that I don't ever go over a certain length. We can do that too. I call that the, like the enhanced manual straight stitch. You set a long length on your straight stitch, but you use your penetration points to drop those spots. You can do that. Uh, manual stitching is good for that too. But like I said, it's fairly simple. And then we're just using these connectors or allowing for the jumps to just run. Uh, it depends on how you do it. The thing is, we're just trying to emulate that thickness. The other thing I was talking about earlier where we emulate a hand stitch type, of course, this is not a French knot. We know that this is often uh, called a candle wick or a dot, depending on your software. Uh, in our software in Stitch Artist, it's certainly, I believe it's candle wick, where you can drop a run of these candle wicks and it essentially just keeps on rotating around making a little dot by having stitches that rotate around 360 degrees and cover that area. So that's one of those things you can do. Your motif stitching, you could build it, build your own motif if you wanted to. Heck, you could even copy and paste it built manually. But we all know that we can't make a knot. So what are we doing? We're using that candle wick style uh, stitch in order to make that. So a motif stitch that does that rotating dot is all we need to make that piece happen. So that's that's the emulation. The thing is, when you look, no matter which of these pieces you look at, we're kind of still seeing that same, uh, the kind of concept of roughness, that concept of uh, the sheen and the use of those different stitches for filling. Um, certainly, if we look at a piece like this, this is another fashion piece, you're seeing that we're doing this kind of loose, instead of actually filling completely, we're doing this loose work that is straight stitch shading that's tightly shaded over the top of some other embroidery. There's an attached patch in this particular case. But this one doesn't have all of the different features. This one uses a lot of really standard machine embroidery and only does uh, some of this looseness and jaggedness up in the top of the wing. It has multi-pass stitches up here and down here. There's some multi-pass stitches as well. As far as in the satins, we have jaggedness as well, and it makes it look more organic. But certainly we're seeing that in a lot of these pieces, right? We have that kind of look. Um, the other thing you're going to see is people emulating hand work like this. This is emulating silk shading. But at the same time, it's very obviously machine embroidered work. And you can see also that we're using either like a stem or a back stitch to make this instead of a standard um, satin. You can also just take a satin and lean those stitch angles over really extremely. And we get that look of that back stitch. And you'll see also um, nowhere in here is a standard tatami fill, or at least not as we would understand it. Uh, we, you could probably make this from a long length tatami fill in, that's done radially. You could do something like that. But in any case, what the look is more like overlap satins. The look is more like that kind of sat, that silk shading instead of the kind of shading you would see um, where all the stitches are following the same angle, which is what we often do for gradients and stuff like that. You're not going to see that as much as you'll see this, um, especially in florals. There's a lot of silk shading. Uh, done. And I think that's something that's interesting to look at where we're just interleaving the materials. But what you can see is because we're doing machine embroidery that the returns, those angled returns are coming back across it because we can't work underneath. We can't do the long and short work of silk shading as you would do in hand work without coming back across it. So we do see a lot of these angled return stitches that are kind of coming back from the ends of these travels. And it's almost impossible to do something about that. Uh, the other thing you're going to see here is as in the leaves, um, especially with things that are going to be worn, this is particularly on a garment, you're going to see satin stitches that have either, um, these are length limit stitches or auto split or something of that nature or program splits in order to keep them kind of loose and low. And you can use a wide satin column, but this kind of split looks more like overlap satins and still lets you fill a large area without having the very mechanical look of the stepped tatami stitch. Like I said, I think these are things to look at and you'll say, I, honestly, most of these are fairly easily achieved. These are usually settings in your software. If we talk about the way we're digitizing, the things that are going to make difference here is just that we don't make big blocks of individual or big, big giant mass blocks of fill. That is the biggest thing to avoid if you're trying to achieve this look. If we're talking about the floss style embroidered look, then the thing to look at are, like I said, bean stitches, stems, stem and back stitches, um, multi-pass uh, satins or increased count, which I've told you guys that before, the count on satins, and I'll show you that again, or a whip stitch. 
those are ways that we get that kind of thick look, that we get that floss look from our work. Uh, same thing here. And this is something that's classic. It's been around a long time. Lisa teaches a great, Lisa Shaw does teaches a great uh, class based on, on doing this kind of neckline work. But once again, if we zoom in on this neckline, very obviously this is not thick thread. They did not go to the trouble of doing extra thick thread. This is spun polyester. We have short stitches. So they're really exaggerating the fact that it has these penetration points. So short stitches, um, multi-pass straights. That's all this is. This is bean stitch, short stitches, uh, done in such a fashion that it produces a thicker line, but they're exaggerating the look of stitches that we're often trying to avoid when we're dealing with machine embroidery. People don't love when their lettering looks stitchy most of the time. In this case, and I see this kind of work done on stockings, uh, done also to kind of either replicate or replace traditional chain stitch lettering, which you may have seen. Uh, think the old school Mickey Mouse hats is what everybody tells me from, from another generation. The traditional chain stitch following lettering, this is often how we deal with that. You can certainly use a chain motif to also do that, but this is what I'm seeing a lot of recently uh, and have seen a lot of over the years, using this to make this look more like a floss stitched set of lettering that's done, like I said, hand, as hand work. Uh, certainly that's part of it. So these are things that I think are fairly interesting to look at. Um, certainly in florals, like I said previously, a lot of the florals are gonna be using that silk shading look. And you can still see how, it, how this is done with open, loose, overlapping satin blocks. So instead of defining this whole area of this petal as one piece, we're going to define uh, four, I would believe we have four satin columns in this case, two in one color, two in another. And we are being very careful about using our colors to create that gradation. We're not worrying quite as much about the long and short silk shading in this particular piece. But what we are seeing is that we are using overlapped satin stitches at a looser, uh, density and not worrying very much about the full coverage in this case, because we're allowing there to be some uh, natural gaps that occur in the embroidery. Uh, and certainly once again, you'll see in these leaves that we're going to have that kind of um, broken patterned satin and overlapped satins in general. And like I said, this is floral work. This is bohemian work. It's done for a lot of different things, but you'll see it uh, repeatedly that that sort of work is common. And like I said, even if we're just doing something that still is fairly obviously machine embroidery, uh, this crane piece that's here uh, among these florals, this is done on some denim, this is done on jeans. You can still see that they're allowing for much looser coverage. This is not super tight coverage. They're not concerned about that. Uh, and certainly we're allowing for shorter stitches and multiple pass stitches and often choosing light threads for outlining, choosing light threads specifically for doing that sort of text, doing that sort of work so that we're accentuating the penetration points. We want this to look stitched. We're not trying to hide the stitchiness as we often do with commercial logos. When you have to do a fine outline and everybody's unhappy with us if we have to reverse that and it's white uh, because we get all those shadows and it doesn't look like a nice solid white outline. We're not looking for solid. We're looking for stitchy. We're looking for thick and rough. And the same thing here, once again, these, set, these are done with a turning stitch. So we would say this is a length limited satin, a split satin of some kind or a pattern satin. And you can also see that this is not just roughness that's happening here. This is not just the embroidery being loose. We're also dropping some stitches and very likely manually, or at least with intent, we're allowing there to be some dropped stitches in that rotation. Uh, but still, once again, you can still see the kind of things that are happening. This is much more like traditional embroidery or traditional machine embroidery, but once again, no big slabs of fill stitch, uh, lots of split length limited satin stitches, lots of textured satins, not a lot of tatami, not a lot of regularity. And I think that's something you'll see repeatedly. Now, I certainly walk the line when I'm doing that kind of work. Um, this is a piece from one of my larger uh, Slavic pieces. I did a piece for a dress, a big neckline that was shoulder to shoulder. And this is one of the samples from it. This is done, uh, I believe this is Bermelana. It might be Bermelana Co. Um, so this is a thicker thread. This is a 12 weight thread, but this was done with a couple different uh, motifs and elements that are really standard. I did not elect to do the roughness because in this case, I didn't want it to look uh, clumsy. I don't always think that the the ways that we can handle this where people use excess roughness on the edges or really heavy randomness in the density, I think sometimes they look clumsy, they look cruddy, they don't look like bad embroidery 
not amateur embroidery and definitely not like a skilled person who's doing folk embroidery. So I don't always love that. It is something people like to do. They like to use the jaggedness. I think it's interesting uh, if we're trying to maybe add that that uh, distressed look or if we really want some of that roughness, I tend to dial it back a little bit. Some of the stuff that I've seen is really extreme. They'll use really extreme roughness to try and drive home that point of the hand embroidery. I like to be a little less extreme. In this case, I didn't use any roughness, but I'll just kind of break it down for you and show you what I've got here. You can see that I'm using a back stitch here. So we're using a back stitch, which is kind of an angled stitch that tucks into itself along a line. So that is a line stitching is usually used for outlines. It's a little thicker than a straight stitch. So we're coming in with a back stitch in the back and we have two conventional satins. So in this case, really, we're using the thick thread to make this happen. So conventional satins uh, done at a target density, I believe it's about nine points or 0.9 mils in this case for the three weight thread on this one. Super fuzzy. So it fills in, has nice complete coverage. In this case, I wanted more complete coverage. I think if I was going to make this a big commercial run of garments that had this neckline, the likelihood it is I would probably dial that density back even a little bit more, allow just a little bit more show through. And honestly, the lighter you can make the stitching on a garment piece, um, the better the hand is, the better the drape is on the person. So we got a couple of uh, overlap satins here that jump in from this side. Then we go out here. We've got these overlap satins as well, but this is going to be last. The pink goes last. So of course, we're going to go ahead and do this salmon color up to here. I ran a hidden straight stitch up through this. Go back usually and do that. You can do that for one place if you want to, if you want to end back here. In this case, you don't have to run that hidden straight stitch. You can also just run up toward this end and knot it. If you don't want this knot here, or you don't want to have to tie off inside of that and have that show up. In this case, it doesn't bother me. You could run that hidden straight stitch and then run it backward to this point, or if you're doing it as a single color. In this case, the multiple colors, you may just stop here and, and trim. But we're running, essentially, we've got a satin that we increase our angle until we almost meet the angle of the back stitching here. So that is, a, that is just me taking the satin and changing my inclinations until I get close to that angle that's up here in the back stitch. And then we run these overlap satins, very similar to what you would do in any other sort of uh, what I would call dimensional carved kind of floral work. So in this case, and I'll, I'll agree with uh, Gina here, certainly, uh, the yarn is the star here. Yeah, truthfully, the yarn gives you the roughness, the, uh, the Bermelana thread in this particular case by brand, but whatever uh, thread that you have that has some fuzz to it, that has some texture to it can uh, be the star. And I'll show you a couple pieces that were done um, essentially just to show stitch types that were more like that kind of fashion embroidery. I still think these look very much like machine embroidery, but you'll see kind of where we're going with that. Uh, these were two pieces that were done on a very light tool and they were meant to match an existing piece of embroidery that was done. You can see that what we have here, um, we're essentially using, again, we have this back stitch being used as the central spine of this floral. And yes, this was done with water soluble stabilizer that was rinsed completely away. So we're using nice light densities here. We're being very careful, but we used a, a full span of water soluble stabilizer behind this and rinsed it completely away in the final uh, portion of this. Um, what we're also going to see here is some very traditional kind of rosettes. What we have here is actually overlap satins and there's two courses of those. There's a single dot in the middle and then there are individual uh, kind of wrapped satins that come out into these petals. And then we have once again, that back stitch trailing into those uh, loose satin, uh, the loose satin leaves here. And then for the main monogram, we're going to see essentially just loose satin stitches. And in this case, didn't do multi-pass, just used uh, some, uh, some underlay to kind of stabilize it. And we've got this loose satin here that goes into a length limited patterned satin used here. And once again, the kind of randomness of either an auto split or a length limited satin in this case, does give it that sense of it still being an overlapped satin rather than something that's filled, but we can run a fairly wide piece and have it lay very flat. But just to kind of show you some of the differences that happen just from color selection and from thread type, same design run essentially on a piece of, a, of canvas uh, with a spun polyester thread. So here we have a tonal version of that design run on canvas. I've got to rotate it here, but this is the C out of the two uh, letters that we were there. The other one was the E that was there. The same sort of looseness. And in this case, instead of playing with the with the settings whatsoever in, the, in this one, I went ahead and just allowed the fact that this is on a fairly heavy canvas uh, to be okay. I did not change out for a super sharp needle and try and drive my way through all of these things. I allowed that to roughen the edge and just let that be part of the 
the charm of the thing. And as we can see, once again, we have the traditional satin texture in this top portion that we do have a loose density. And we used a auto split or, uh, or a, um, like I said, either an auto split or a length limited. If you're in uh, stitch art, it's a length limit pattern on that satin column to create that texture that's in here. And once again, we have that, we have that normal rosette with those overlapped, uh, the overlapped petals, and we have these pieces here. So once again, we have the, that same sort of satin stitch down there. So it's not super alien from what we do in commercial embroidery, and it doesn't take something, you don't have to use specialty settings to get to a look that is more like handwork. Uh, in this case, certainly the uh, yarns are part of it. As people said, the threads are part of it. So the sheen of the thread can be a big deal. And I'll be super honest with you on this one. This is not specialty embroidery thread. This is serger thread. So I'm lightening my densities. I used spun polyester serger thread. That is just the honest truth. That is what I had and what I was playing with. So I'm not saying you're going to do that for everything. It's not always the best way to go. I love to use embroidery specific thread, but when I'm doing some tests like that, sometimes I will play with that stuff and free, frankly uh, worked pretty well. And as you can see, here's, here's actually a piece that is once again, from my retail research pile, you guys know that I go and look at stores and look at things that were being put out in the fashion world. These were done and this is on shoes. So yeah, these are shoe uppers that were constructed afterwards as a pa panel program. And I think it falls down a little bit because we've used uh, to stitch the shoe upper on, we have this really thick fuzzy and you can see how much fuzz is on this slipper style shoe. There's an incredible amount of fuzz on this thread, but when they did the embroidery on the top, even though they were doing the kind of split satin work, this radio work, they also were not real careful about the splits in this particular auto split. And that made this have a very defined split edge that I don't know that they meant to do. Uh, and once again, we do have some candle waking with satins, but I find that the shine on this particular piece almost gives away the look a little bit. Now, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that. It's a choice that you have to make for yourself, but these were extremely high sheen uh, threads. Certainly it probably makes them a lot tougher since this is on a shoe to use the poly for that. I would have loved to see a matte poly and maybe a little more variation. I think this looks so clean that it doesn't quite give the look, right? To me, this is a little super clean and I'm seeing these really, really fine threads in it. And it looks very much like machine embroidery to me, even though it's done with more hand style stitching. So for me, I think you could carry it further if you wanted to on a piece like this. Like I said, these are all, these are just ways you can handle it, things you can do. And I'll actually show you a couple of the pieces I've done. Uh, I'm actually, I have two of these that are peacock feathers that I've done for people. This is a smaller version that's up on my website. Uh, but what you can see is that this feather stitch, which is very much mocking or, you know, making a faux version of a hand stitch. So these motif stitches, you see that these are feather stitches through here. And then once we get up into the thinner area that's up in the top, this is not a great picture. I'll show you one of the other pieces. We're using back stitches and we get further up to the top and we have more kind of diaphanous feathery, very light elements that are in the top, tip of the feather. We go from this feather stitch, which is fairly robust and has this distinct pattern into a back stitch. And once again, we just have a couple layers of color. We run, we're running one of the greens, then the second green, and then we have this satin in the center that's gonna cover up the spine and all the travels. We go from the feather stitch into the back stitch. And you see me tilting those ankles as we get further up into the top. And at the very end, at the tip of this feather, what we're actually seeing uh, is straight stitches. And once again, this is just two light layers where I've done one of the greens first, and then I come back in and fill more of that with the green. And we have just a natural variation where I've just drawn further and closer together uh, these different lines of stitching. And then patterned radially, this again is a, um, it is a satin stitch that has a pattern applied to it. So we have multiple rows of satin that make up the central piece. And I'll say I cheated. The very center of this is actually shaded to Tommy Phil. Uh, you can call it a cheat if you want to. And it's based on a larger piece I did that's actually this is a full length dress. And I mean, this dress is, well, it's a dress from, uh, it's a skirt. From the hip to the floor, it is all metallic thread, um, metallic thread peacock feather. Uh, it's really huge. I did this for a fashion piece. But what I wanted to show you is we talked about motif stitches again. This is one of those places where a motif stitch really uh, does its job, especially when we're talking about metallic threads. You guys know the metallic threads have that sparkle depending on the angle and it changes as you, as you move through, uh, through the room. This piece goes same thing. It has those loose feathers. So we have the feather stitching. We have that going all the way up through the top. As we get up to the top into those thin threads, very similar to the other one, you'll see that we get into the back stitching. So I have something thinner, but it still has some texture to it. Not open satin because I don't want the zigzag. I want to maintain some of that look of that of the directionality and angle. 
and then we're up into straight stitches. And once again, you can see I'm using fairly short stitch lengths here, both to keep it tight to the garment and because I want sparkle. Just like in handwork where I want to uh, accentuate those penetration points, for metallics, you may want sparkle and sparkle is achieved by having all those different angles. And a lot of that is we wanna have a fair number of penetration points in that. Some of those short stitches can enhance that sparkle. So I think that that's something interesting to think about is how is it affecting that look? And we can kind of look a little bit more at the head of the feather here. Once again, you can see that I go up into this back stitching here, and then we have rows of loose satin that make this up, but they are um, satins that are patterned with a fill-like pattern. You could also do the length limit in this case. In this one, I wanted it to lay flatter. And so I used a tatami-like pattern and did what was essentially a turning fill, but it's radial. It turns like a sand stitch around the end. So this is certainly, like I said, this is part of that handwork emulation is to not have really regular division lines, not have very regular patterns in your fills if you use fills at all, and to think about using more of these satin stitch tile, uh, style stitches. Lap satins are going to be much more indicative of this style. So lap satin stitch is better in that in my case. And I would say also um, multi-pass satins can certainly be a port part of that look. Um, and any sort of multi-pass thick thread look is certainly part of that thing, part of that kind of uh, overall look. And here I'll show you again that the feather. This is the entire feather on the dress. And like I said, this is a huge piece. This is a this is quite large, like I said, from, from hip to floor on this particular piece. But it is something that is, uh, I think, interesting. It does have some additional um, hand-placed rhinestones on this. This is not something you're going to do every day. But like I said, heirloom work, fashion work, bohemian work, it may be the kind of thing where um, this can be reused quite a lot. So doing some extra handwork on the design side of it is not a problem. But like I said earlier, some of that handwork emulation, even if you're doing it in a corporate way. It's something I always show when I talk about uh, thick threads. This is a corporate style logo. It has that very clean sans serif font, but just by opening up the densities and using that thick thread that's fuzzy, we're getting a, a very warm look to it. So it doesn't necessarily require all the randomness in order to look more handmade and warmer. Part of it can just be fiber count. And we do have that kind of looseness just by like loosening up the density and using this on a canvas background, we actually end up with a little bit of roughness that we can allow. And that can be part of our uh, design ethos, part of what we're trying to get out of it. And I think that's interesting. Certainly, um, I also would say, despite the fact that this was by no means intended to look like handwork, it was supposed to be more distressed. This piece that I often show you guys um, from Knob Hill Bar and Grill is also in that range, right? If we look at the way that it's been done, I think it fits into this into that mold as well. You can see that I wanted it to be a little distressed. So I've got really open fills. This does still use fill stitches, very regular. So I wouldn't call this emulated handwork, but the concept is still there. The idea of the floss look is brought out through the multi-pass stitching. These are incredibly heavy. It's a standard, uh, the standard metallic thread. You can see that foil wrap thread here. It's very visible when we're zoomed in this far. But also these backgrounds are done with multi-pass uh, whip stitch satins as well. And I think it still kind of goes into that style. The multi-pass uh, straight stitch here being used for the argyle lines. We have a faux chain that's being used here for the edge and that border. So we're using those motifs. And we're using the multi-pass whip satins here um, with a very loose density that allows us to see some of the fabric showing through. So this, in this case, this is more of the distressed look. Like I said before, when we're doing collegiate, collegiate style, maybe corporate style work, you may do more of a distressed look because it's got this rough cut applique patch and it has this loose open work, but it is texturally interesting and still has some of the hallmarks of what I would call that emulated uh, handwork and machine embroidery. And we look really, really closely. You can get a, a solid look at how that's playing out here where we have these longer stitch lengths in the fill. Um, we do have some variation in it, and we definitely have that thickness of built up multi-pass and whip stitches in the uh, in the main logo. Like I said, multi-pass and whip stitches, we've talked about them before. I'll just bring you through them again. Um, this is one of the samples I did when we were originally working on our whip stitch. And sometimes you can see it very clearly in the um, in this uh, matte finish polyester that doesn't have any fuzz, where we're just running multiple stitches on every uh, parallel hit on that satin. And you can see in this case, I'm using roughness or jaggedness on the edge to help emulate it. I think this is too clumsy for the look of handwork. Frankly, I don't like it for the look of handwork. I think it is more of the distressed look 
it looks like stitching that is missing stitches and that might be more interesting or it looks like very thick uh almost what i would say careless or intentionally brutal looking work which i would think is interesting for something where we we are intimating the concept that somebody wanted it to be rough or roughness is part of the of the design work uh and in this case even if we don't really go whole hog on it this is spun polyester thread still fairly thin thread and the whip stitching multi-pass stitching still gives you this this sense of floss or handwork because we're trying to look like a full uh, a full tilt all of the different uh, pieces of the floss run without using individual strands so it is kind of that same look i think that's interesting and like i said i've shown you this uh, before but i did this sample of what i consider a whip stitch uh treatment in this e and let me get one of the better uh examples of this and I just thought this still, once again, still kind of has the ethos of the handwork. And how do we show that ethos or what are we talking about here? We are filling this large area. There's a pretty large piece with multiple satins. So we've got two satins here that have a rough edge in the center. So we're breaking that up. We don't have a very, very clean line in the center. Uh, and it is overlapped. So we don't have just a penetration point where you're seeing anything through. It's lapped in this case to get a full fill. And you can see that we're using a back stitch for the outer border. And so it looks very floss, like very hand embroidered, very vintage. So it looks like a pre-machine piece, uh, despite being very obviously machine embroidery. And one of the other pieces that we did, one of the other samples is to use um, opposite angles when we were doing that satin work. And I think this very much harkens back to the motif style work, to the feather stitch and to hand embroidery in that case. So I think that it can be used in multiple ways and there's many, many ways that we can uh, approach the concept of, uh, you know, using a hand stitch like piece. I think there is certainly something to that. And in emulating handwork, we end up with some of those similar, you know, some of those similar techniques. Uh, one of the other things I would like to talk about really briefly, I think it's just interesting in and of itself because we're talking about emulating handwork is uh, counted stitch work or cross stitch work. And we can talk about knits really quickly. Um, for those of you who wanted to see my piece on knits, um, definitely go back and check out in the links list, the holiday episode. That holiday episode from last year, I really went a little further into discussing the knit style that I did. Um, you will see that I, I include that in some of these picture pieces that I was talking about. Um, but the knit style piece, I don't know if I've got that in here, if I've just got it in the other stack. I think I have it in my other stack. Um, but if we check that out, it, it was that piece where I emulated knits using cotton thread. But let's go ahead and discuss it really briefly. Um, this is another one of those those ways where I'm emulating a different kind of handwork is a different work. It's not needlework, it's, it is knit work. And the thing is though, I wanna point out that it's very similar in the way we go about it. If you're trying to emulate a hand stitch piece that you're looking at, we are going to look at what the obvious qualities of the threads we can see on the face of the piece are, right? If it's if we're talking about silk shading, well, we know in, the, in silk shading that the different colors are leaving together and they're in this angle. We can see what the angles are. We can look at the, rough, the roughness of the edge. We can look at the length of the individual stitches and we can look at how deep the overlap is. We look at what is on the surface of the piece and then we think about how we're gonna emulate that. And I think that's the same thing if we're doing something like this. If you're trying to emulate a knit, when I'm looking at a knit, the obvious things that are, are staring me in the face are these individual little kind of V shapes. They're not perfectly V shapes, but I'm trying to emulate this in a way that people get that sense. I'm not trying to make this look exactly like a knit piece. And I'll say, because I know that they're actually loops that are knit together, that those Vs stack together. And that stacking action is part of what makes full coverage, but that there's a little bit of looseness and that there's some air, there's some gaps that show through. That's what I'm trying to show. And if I know that I have some, I have these lengths that I can look at, I can go, okay, how long is the row that I'm trying to look at, the row of these stitches, right? How deep is the inset? How deep do the Vs go together? How thick is the individual yarn in the piece that we're looking at? And I can say, all right, they look like Vs. I know I have to produce something that creates Vs. In this case, I'm using a manual stitch. I'm driving these manually. I think you could use motifs for this, certainly, if you wanted to. Um, for me, trying to get the travels where I wanted them to make them also efficient, I didn't do that. Um, but that's the thing. In this case, no matter what I was looking at, whether I was looking at uh, some other piece of cruel work or embroidery of some other kind, or I'm looking at a knit garment that I'm trying to emulate, what I'm looking at with any sort of fiber art are the direction that the stitch or the fibers are laying, the length of the fiber object that I'm looking at, the direction that it's traveling, uh, 
and how it interacts with other fibers in its neighborhood that are next to it. And in this case, the knit is the same as any embroidered piece, and I don't think it's that much different to figure out. I will go ahead and just show you once again kind of the, the version of what I ended up doing here. In this case, you can see in the digitizing, these are multiple passes that are Vs that are inset to each other. So these are three pass legs. So you can see it's one, two, three, four, five, six. We're going back across these passes. And as we do that, we're building up the thickness up to something that is more like yarn. We have a distance that's set. How did I figure out this distance? I made different Vs, put them together, and then stacked them and saw how close they, together they had to be to get the kind of coverage I wanted. Also, you can see that I'm not nesting really deeply in here because that's where my little gaps are gonna be and show through some of the material. And I just kind of kept going through that process and traveling. I used odd numbers of travels so that I'm always traveling in a direction. If you use an even number, you end up back at the start of any motif that you make. If you use an odd number of passes, you end up at the other side. So it is one of those things you have to watch for. Um, the number of passes, if it's odd, you're still traveling away from the point you started. If it's even, you're heading back some way you will be back and you'll have to travel forward again anyway. So those odd numbers of passes, how I got it done. So what have I done? I used multi-pass stitches to build up the thickness of the individual fiber bundles, uh, the yarn. I used the angles that I saw in the knit to create which angles I wanted. I looked at those and saw how those were. I saw how close together these bundles would be. And then I nested them in together to create the, the finished piece that looks like this. And the thing is, I think that that analysis is the same with anything else we're looking at. If I'm looking at any of those other pieces that we talked about before, um, I could do the same thing here. If I'm trying to mock any of these other pieces, really, honestly, it's the same tool no matter what that I have to use. It's my mind. It's my ability to, to analyze what's in front of me. Um, certainly these are very easy because it looks like what we really have in any of these is just straight stitches that are layered together, but I can look at how far apart they are. I can look at the angle that they are in this case, the shine on this water, uh, essentially on this river is at the same angle as the rest. But if we're looking at the head up here in this peacock, well, then we can see we have opposing angles on both sides for most of the pieces, or we can see that in the neck, the angles follow the neck around in a kind of sinuous motion overall. These things are things we can see and we can emulate. And in any type of stitching, we're going to be emulating the things that we're looking at. And that's already what's being done. So I think that that's something we can think about. You don't have to use specialty tools for it. And sometimes the specialty tools can get in your way if they're doing too much or if they're too random, you might not get exactly what you want. Um, do they exist? Yes. I'll show you briefly. I, I actually have a sample uh, made from a a tool that, that uses this. So I'll show you this. Um, applying a hand effect in a piece of software that has a hand stitch effect. On the left-hand side is an element that I made for one of my patches. It's the Harvest Heroes patch. So as you can see, it is a little bundle of wheat with a sickle. It had an outline on it, but I took the outline off in copying this over so we could, it would be a little cleaner look at. On the right-hand side was a default hand stitching setting that was in a piece of software I was using. And I thought for my money, if I look at this piece over here, um, I really would have to redesign the piece so I would be happy with the way it turned out. We had some pretty extreme density bundling going on in the layers. Uh, and I would also say that at least by default, I would be playing with this to change some of the things about the way it bundled uh, the stitching. Because I found that some of the randomness in the stitch angles here, this doesn't to me look like handwork. It looks like poor work. So it's not that you can't use uh, automatic randomized settings. Sometimes they're cool. Sometimes they do some cool stuff. And if you play with them for a while, you get somewhere. Um, I, For me, this didn't look like hand work. It looked like distressed work, which is fine for maybe distressed work, but it wasn't what I was looking for. And the other thing I'll tell you is um, if you're using regular underlay, sometimes that regular underlay is really going to poke out and look very mechanical and weird. If you're doing something extreme like this, I would certainly think about tearing that out and just... Uh, knowing that underlay is not part of your game. Uh, in this case, I just wanted to show you what might be had from that. We can kind of do a, a left and right. This is a standard satin with really even uh, presentations, really even densities. We look over here and that's something that's made with a hand effect generator. Um, for me, that is not exactly what I want from hand work. I probably would be more uh, happy just to apply a little bit of roughness to the edge, maybe alter my density somewhat. Definitely think about either pulling in or removing uh, any of my underlay that's there. But I think some of the randomness and the angles and the way that it's bundled in this case, um, I'm not really into it as uh, I don't think that it looks very much like handwork to me. 
or at least it was a little extreme in some cases, but you can adjust it. So that's the kind of thing that you can totally adjust if you're using a tool like that. But what I would say is caution, I would caution you to look at it and say, what is it that I'm going for? What part of am I trying to emulate? Uh, is it something that I'm trying to do to make it look rough? Is the roughness and the randomness exactly what I'm looking for? Or is it more like the pieces I'm showing you where I have the sense of the handwork, but I don't want it to look like, like I said, clumsy or amateurish. Certainly you can use some of that. I think that some of the roughness of the edge here is good. I think that when we're trying to make something look like it has a bit of jitter to it, or maybe that it was done in an amateur fashion using a little bit of roughness or jaggedness is interesting. And I especially think that when the original piece was meant to be very uh, regular and very, um, I guess we can just say that it was supposed to be very geometric, it's interesting to see it in a deconstructed fashion. I don't know how much that always looks like handwork as much as it looks like poor work. So it's it's up to you. I, like I said, it's up to everybody's particular uh, sense of how it goes. For me, I think handwork is more like uh, the work of a talented amateur is interesting. It's got some looseness. It might not have full coverage. It uses coarser materials, perhaps, but it looks like someone who took some care to it. I like that work, especially if we're talking about things like holiday, if we're talking about things that are traditional or folk work, whereas the super destroyed kind of really random uh, angle settings and stuff, I'm not as into for that. And I think it's more the play of distressed work or something that you want to look intentionally aged, distressed, destroyed, or glitched on purpose. And that's, like I said, there's a place for all that. It really just depends on what you're after. Um, when I'm talking about emulating handwork for things like, uh, you know, holiday tech, stuff like that, I'm much more likely to be using just some multi-pass and a little bit of jitter or looseness in my, uh, in my densities, or like these folks did, even though it looks a little clumsy when we look at it closely, um, doing manually drawn lines so that there is a little bit of natural um, difference in spacing and being a little looser with my rendition and doing that manually instead of uh, leaving it to be kind of a setting. So it really it depends on how you feel about it. Um, the other one I want to talk about briefly, like I said, uh, counted work. Uh, in as much as just saying that there are multiple different ways to do counted work depending on software. Software may have point and click counted work or it may have uh, cross stitch fills. I'm going to tell you that either one of these is very viable. Um, and especially if we're doing single color fields across stitch, uh, sometimes using the filled stitch work is uh, quite a bit faster than using the counted point and click version. Just depends on what you're trying to do. I will say that it does look fairly regular and that you may elect if you're trying to get an extremely handmade look to do something that isn't as regular and use either manually created crosses that you're careful about your plotting, maybe even like back work, you're doing the individual crosses. They're, they're just multiple passes of stitching. As you know, cross stitches in this case are the same way. They're multi-pass stitches that enter and exit. So we end up with a cross. Um, but when we use the the tools, we will get a very regular stitch. And it, it just depends on how you, how you feel about it. I actually like both. I like both versions. In this case, I'll go ahead and show you one of the pieces. This is done from a, once again, this is a historical exemplar with a monogram. So it had a thick and a thin monogram style. And this is the finished piece that I did. This one was was done with completely regular um, cross stitches that were were done with a cross stitch fill pattern. So I drew the outside edge of this and drew some of these shapes in so I could have really tight control. And I layered these two pieces together uh, with that standard machine cross stitch. I think it still looks interesting. In this case, it's on felt. So it doesn't look as much like uh, maybe counted work on a counted work cloth, like Ida cloth would look, but I still think it's pretty interesting and it gives you an interesting texture. And the other thing I've seen recently and something that's cool in the embroidery nerd group is I've seen people using cross stitch fills as a background for traditional satin stitch or even for, um, if not satin stitch work, uh, sometimes work that was done with like 3D foam or other textures that are very, uh, very kind of machine made and very regular. And I think that's interesting too. So there are ways to use it as a fill texture. Uh, as you can see in this particular piece, um, I think it, it turned out pretty interesting as this cut edge felt patch. Uh, I did once again use a spun polyester thread. So it has a little bit of buzz to it but it's a super regular piece. And I think that, that it's still an interesting way to go. I find that counted cross work is, um, you know, I think it's really interesting and, I, and there's a lot of examples of it. You can certainly do more detailed counted cross work. This is one of the earliest pieces I ever did for machine embroidery with counted cross work. It was done from a commercial pattern. So it's not something I can give you or give away. And it's definitely, I mean, more modern cross stitch work. The last piece was probably from the 1800s. This piece is a way modern piece of counted cross work, this Raven. Uh, but once again, this was done with a point and click system. And then the thing I did though on this one, 
I manually did this very uh, angular back stitch outlining and detail work. And that was done manually with, with a manual stitch or with a straight stitch tool. Uh, either would work fine, but in this case I did it manually. So I had a very regular stitch length. And that was done once again off of the pattern, just as you would do any other kind of cross stitching. You just have to follow and count very carefully. What I will say is uh, there are some preparatory things you can do to get yourself the best kind of uh, the best result from doing counted work in uh, in your embroidery software if you want it to be very regular. And the biggest part of the prep work that I think is is worthwhile to us and interesting to us is to make sure that you are um, getting your sizes of the cross stitches themselves. They will be sized. Uh, and it depends on the cross stitches or the particular um, style that you're working with. Uh, in this case, we have stitches per inch. That's usually how they're measured. And you, if you have your stuff scanned in 100%, and you know what the stitches per inch are. Uh, you can actually set those stitches per inch and make sure that your grid's going to line up roughly. So what I would say is, if you're using a fill style um, cross stitch piece like this is, where you're drawing a shape that's going to be filled with cross stitches, um, get your your um, image into the software, scale it appropriately, and like make yourself a block of cross stitches at the same size as the squares you want them to eventually be. Then size your image and align your image so that the cross stitches line up where you want them to on the piece and that you are at the scale you want to be at. Now, this particular piece, once again, this is from the 1800s. This is late 1800s, um, a pattern book that was given as a gift. It was a, it was, uh, a German pattern book, the one that I'm looking at here um, that I started to work from. And in the case of this piece, I will say the printing is a little screwy and that the scan is not perfect. When, we, when you're working with that, you may just have to do your best to get the count. As you can see, some of this is not properly on the line. But the biggest thing to do with preparation for counted cross stitch like this, no matter what style you're using, is to look at the scale of the image and the scale of the finished crosses and make sure that lines up. You can always change that scale later and use different size cross stitches later once your piece is done. But for your sanity, uh, try and get your shapes to line up and make sure that the crosses are going to be uh, aligned to your image. So make yourself a block of crosses, make sure that they line up uh, you know, vertically and horizontally with the image that you have in your software. And that's really about just scaling your image correctly and then aligning it to that grid, uh, depending on what kind of software you're using. But like I said, the counter cross stitch, when you do it uh, with, this, with the machine can look very regular and very mechanical to a degree, but it's still, as you can tell, it still does have that cross stitch feeling to it. I think it's still interesting and creates a lot of interesting texture and you can use some of those historical pieces. Certainly, like I said, uh, you can go into the more modern pieces as well, but you're gonna find, find that that's going to be more like a complete fill. And for me, um, once I started doing this, this one particularly, the other thing you can change on cross stitch is the count. So just like uh, a, a multi-pass satin stitch, if you have a higher count, it's going to make them thicker because we're going to have multiple stitches, uh, a higher count of stitches that make up each leg of the cross. Uh, that's going to make it thicker and denser. And sometimes you actually find you've made a piece like this and it just looks like a weird textured fill. It doesn't give the cross stitch feeling because part of that sense of cross stitch that we're looking for is to actually see the crosses. And that's not necessarily what all good cross stitch is supposed to look like. And not everybody would want that in their actual hand cross stitch work. But when you're doing it as a counterpoint, as something that's not supposed to look like machine embroidered stitching, um, what can happen is that the cross stitch being so tight just makes it look like a really, as you can see here, it looks kind of like a funny pattern fill because you can't really see the gaps in the cross stitching. Whereas if you do something that is very, that you exaggerate a little bit, you use a lower count per leg, they may look a little bit anemic here, especially on this felt. But um, part of the distinctiveness of that stitch is to see the gaps in between the stitching is to see the crosses. When someone is looking for something that feels homey, that looks like machine, like hand embroidery to them, you're going to find that they often want to see the flaw. They want to see the openness and the uh, stitch change as you have it here. They want to see some of that. They don't just want to see a completely fully filled piece. And in that other piece, you can see certainly um, it's not actually as much as much as as you might think. It might not be as important to get coverage in this piece. Like I said, this piece was interesting to me, but to my eye, it looks like a weird patterned fill and it looks very angular for no reason. Whereas the reason for this to be very pixelated looking and angular 
is in its style and it is communicating that very well. It makes sense to me. And I just thought I would show you this is an actual hand stitch piece that wasn't done on like traditional Ida cloth work. And the reason I'm showing you this vintage piece is just to kind of show you both a really cool, interesting pattern and a piece of vintage uh, cross stitch work, but also to kind of say, as you can tell, if you use a machine setup, if you use machine embroidery and software to do your cross stitching and you use exactly the same size and placement of stitches, um, the one thing you'll miss out is there is some interesting variation that can happen if you do them manually. Now, I understand time being what it is, manual cross stitching may be kind of uh, difficult, may be kind of hard. But at the same time, if that's what you're looking for and you're making a pattern you're going to be using forever or selling as a stock design or something like that, it might be interesting and it's worth looking at the potential of uh, making some cross stitches that you know where they start and where they end and how they could be put in sequence and then working out some different variations or letting some rows be tighter or looser or allowing for some of them to move. Or if you did a programmed cross stitch like I just showed you where it was uh, done by a fill that is very regular, you could elect to go in with a stitch editor, lasso some stitch points and move some things around so you have some longer and shorter legs that you might end up uh, you know, enjoying the look of that roughness. And I'd say also we can see here is the look of that thick, uh, floss is definitely in, present here. And I think it's, like I said, I think it's an interesting piece, um, a piece of vintage cross stitch work that I, I just happen to have in my collection of linens. But it's something that I think is interesting. And we can see how also uh, the alignment of the crosses is used to make these nice big open diamond patterns here in the chest. And I think it's interesting to look at. So it may be something to, to consider that doing some of that work manually, removing some of the stitches, moving some of the edges so that there's some jitter. I find some of these textural differences that are here in, in the tail that are here up in the chest. Uh, I find those to be interesting and draw the eye for me. And I would actually like that exaggeration in a piece that is supposed to look very handmade. And I think that's something that sometimes you can lose, but I would say if we look at pieces like this, I don't think there's too much lost here. And there's a natural variation just in the fact that it's stitched and depending on what, uh, you know, what thread you're using and what material you're using, I think it would be really interesting to see. So in any case, folks, I think we'll go ahead and leave it there. Uh, I can show you a couple other pieces I've done. Like I said, I've done some other cross stitch style pieces. These are very programmatic, um, certainly. But for me, the counted pieces, if I had one tip, the one tip is just to get your scale worked out. Um, do some samples of the different counts of the crosses so you know how thick they're going to be. Uh, so you know what that thickness is going to look like so that you know what your overall uh, your overall piece is going to look like um, as far as the density of each of the crosses and how thick the lines are going to be. And then get your scale right as far as digitizing that your grids are lining up well with the grids that are in the system, whether you're having that point and click style or you have the fill style is really immaterial. It just, you wanna make sure that your art is lined up and scaled appropriately for that. And I think that's one of those things that is interesting for me. I think that that's part of it. Um, and you know, like I said, a little bit of jitter is good. Some of the automatic processes will add more jitter than I like. For me, it's about dancing that line and saying, all right, what do I, what am I trying to get across and thinking about what the look is. You'll have to pardon me. I, I forgot to close a blind and with the new uh, times right now, I've got sunlight coming in that's wiping out the green screen, but at least we're coming to the end of this and it won't be too bad of a technical issue. Um, up in the Embrillion Studios has lovely big picture windows and the New Mexico sun is absolutely beating it on me right now. But what I'm going to say, folks, is that overall, I think what was interesting about this for us, whether we're talking about things like um, like holiday work where we're doing the stuff that's supposed to look very homey, very warm or not, whether we're talking about that or we're talking about distressed work or we're talking about emulating knits, uh, no matter what that is, I think the way we can look at it that is interesting to us overall as an overarching rule is to say, what can we see about a stitch that we want to emulate? And what can we do in software to make that happen? And most of the time, it's actually stuff we have a decent amount of control over. Certainly, I showed you some stitch types to make that happen. Um, the idea of using things like back stitch instead of thin satins to make outlines certainly makes a difference. Motif stitches, chain stitches, feather stitches. These are things that are common to hand embroidery, at least more common there to machine embroidery and using those instead for motif lines for things like I said, showed you the lines in the feather uh, can be interesting. Uh, certainly mixing those motifs together can be interesting as far as textural work. But 
when we're looking at something we want to emulate, it's easy to say, all right, what we have is the same nature of stitches. What are the things we can change about stitches? The length of the stitch, how close they are together, and the angle of the stitch. That's really what we can do. The same thing is present in the knits. The same thing is present in any embroidered piece that you see. We look at the stitches and we say, here is the angle. Here is the length. Here is how close they are together. We can also change where those endpoints of the stitches are. We can use those multi-pass stitches to make them thick and we can create that look of floss, that thickness, that roughness. And we can decide how much of the edge quality of the error of the flaw we want to make things look more like it was done by, let's say, the educated amateur rather than our machines with their mechanical perfection. So whatever way you want to do hand, hand work, whether it's counted work, whether it's the kind of work I showed you, the bohemian work or the holiday work, no matter what that is, I think the thing to think about is what it is that we can control, what it is we're trying to emulate, and certainly uh, think about what about the quality of our thread, the quality of our stitches, and the way things are put together uh, defines that piece. All right, with that, folks, before I am uh, melted here under the sun, I will let you go with that last thought. Look at some embroidery out there in the world, whether it's hand embroidery, whether it's machine embroidery, uh, whether it is fiber art of any other kind, weaving. I've seen people do incredible things where they're emulating plaids. Look at the fibers that are there. Look at the bundles of fibers. Look at how close they are together. Look at how they are constructed. And think about that when you want to go emulate those pieces for yourself. So from very obviously all too sunny New Mexico, I'm going to go ahead and say, uh, I'm glad to have had you guys here for yet another take up. Uh, thank you again for those of you who nominated me. Uh, also, go check out the other awesome nominees at the Embroidery Nerd. Their weekly show got nominated, is up for voting. Whoever you vote for, whoever you're supporting, support the people who do the right thing for you, who help you out, and go out there, engage with that embroidery, do something cool, and try to emulate something new. Uh, I cannot wait to have you guys back again next week, and next week I'll make sure and close the blinds.